a variety of questions pertaining to the topology of sets and uh, deriving necessary optimality conditions. Now I'm going to start talking a little more about the algorithmic questions and um, just to kind of motivate the questions, we're going to focus on a very general purpose algorithm which is of this form, xk plus 1 is equal to some gk of xk. So just to give you an example of the kind of algorithms that I'm referring to, um, so if you remember we talked about a gradient based algorithm, so in that particular case gk of xk would be equal to xk minus gamma k gradient of f of xk, where gamma k is some step length. So in that case the algorithm is xk plus 1 is equal to xk, this is a colon just to say that you assign it. Okay. So that's gk of xk. And what is our goal when I present an algorithm? Well, I'd like to provide necessary conditions on the mappings GK that yield a sequence that converges to the a solution of the original problem. And if so, we want to study how fast the, the sequence converges. Particularly uh, establish whether it's globally convergent, which means that from any arbitrary starting point, it always converges to the solution. And secondly, what is the rate of, the, of convergence? This could be local or it could be global. So the rate could be established from any starting point in some cases. In certain cases, you can only establish it close to the solution. Okay. Um, so here's a gradient descent method. So in the gradient descent method, essentially gk is xk minus alpha k times uh, gradient of xk. So this is gk. Alpha k is a step length. Uh, I'm going to be spending more time on the gradient method, so just bear with me in terms of the, the discussion. What our interest is in trying to establish does, does xk converge to a stationary point or a minimizer of f? Minimizer if the function is convex, a stationary point if the function is not convex. Um, we're also interested in establishing whether you can relate the error in consecutive iterates. So if you can see e of xk plus 1 is less than q times e of xk. If that happens, then the scheme is said to abide by a linear rate of convergence. Okay? That's not the only rate we might get. We might get a sublinear rate where you might get something of this form. And you'll see that in certain settings. Um, you might get a rate like this, f of xk minus f of x star is less than some beta over k where beta is positive and for all k it is greater than zero, greater than zero, okay. Now if you have a twice continuously differentiable function, you get what you can, you can utilize what is called Newton's method. So Newton's method, instead of having just moving along the negative direction of the gradient, you scale the gradient using the Hessian inverse, okay. And so the, the, naturally this, this is a costlier method in terms of per iteration effort because at every iteration I need to compute the Hessian of the function, right? And computing the Hessian of the function requires you to go and evaluate a matrix which is of size order n squared, okay? The global convergence rate, so in this case you can get a faster convergence rate which is, this is called a linear, uh, a quadratic rate of convergence. So look how fast this goes down. So if this is basically k is not q raised to k, it's q raised to 2 raised to k, right? So if you think about this, essentially what you're going to see is if you looked at the error, essentially the error goes down very rapidly. So you might go from 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001 and so on. This is for quadratic. For linear, the error just goes down linearly. So if Q is 0.9, you'll go from 0 0.1, 0 0.09, 0 0.081, still, still very good, but it's not as good as this. Look at this. What's happening is the decimal point is just jumping across, right? So you're doing, you're, you're moving quite fast with quadratic. Now usually quadratic rates of convergence are only available close to the solution, okay? So you don't get them away from the solution. Um, Here's another method, um, it's called a penalty method. 
So in penalty methods, you replace a, a constrained problem with a penalized problem. This penalty function takes all of the constraints and essentially constructs you know, some function. And then you, you essentially try and minimize this function for every step. And you know, penali penalization methods have been known since the 60s. Um, here's an interior point type scheme where you, in the gr gj, which is an inequality constraint, is replaced by what is called a barrier function. So what a barrier function does, it says, I'm going to basically, I'm going to essentially add this function. And look what's happening. If gj gets closer and closer to zero, this is jumping off to plus infinity. So as a consequence, you stay away from the boundary. Now, does that mean that you're not going to get solutions where gj is equal to zero? Yes, you could. But that would only happen when t is very large. Okay, when t is very large, there's a weight on this which becomes very small. So the impacts of being close to the boundary are muted. So interior point schemes use that, that approach. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is move to uh, giving you an introduction to games. Okay, and from games, we're going to move to looking at complementarity representations for simple games. Okay. Um, so this is the well-known prisoner's dilemma where you have two suspects that are arrested and charged with the crime. I'm going to use it as a motivating example. Um, so in this, in this case, what happens is that once they're arrested, each, uh, each prisoner can stay mum, basically say nothing, or think, which is basically uh, turn the other person in. Right? And both, both prisoners can do that. And if both of them confess, both get six months in jail, if one of them confesses and the other doesn't confess, what happens is that um, he gets he or she gets released, the other gets nine months in jail, and vice versa. If both confess, then they get one month each. Okay, so the so I want to make sure that you understand the primitives of these finite strategy games. So the first thing you want to note from here is it's a finite strategy game, where each player has a finite set of choices. In, its, in his or her strategy set. Prisoner 1 has two strategies, while Prisoner 2 also has two strategies. These represent the payoffs of each, each player. So negative 1, if player 1 plays mum and player 2 plays 1, then player 1 gets a payoff of negative 1, while player 2 also gets a payoff of negative 1. So those represent the payoff functions. Now, we index the players. In this case, n is just 2. Right. Player I strategy set is SI. So SI in this particular case is just contains two elements, uh, mum and fink. So S1. Mum, think, both are the same, okay. And um, the player of a payoff of player i is given by u i s one comma s two. So the payoff is only determined once you know what both players have played, okay. Now you can see that in this particular case. So you can see in this particular case. Uh, okay, let me just see. So I want to basically specify one notion of a stable point, right? So the Nash equilibrium, which originates with the, the, the seminal paper by John Nash in 1950, specifies one type of equilibrium, which is the Nash equilibrium. The Nash equilibrium specifies a tuple of strategies at which no player has an incentive to unilaterally deviate. What I mean by that is, if you're at a Nash equilibrium, then given what the other player is doing, given what all the other players are doing, a particular player has no benefit in deviating. So let's go back so that we can establish what that Nash equilibrium is in this case. So for instance, if you, if you started by assuming that this was the Nash equilibrium, okay, so if player one, given what that player two is playing mum, 
if player one decided to switch to Fink, player two would immediately benefit, right? Similarly, if player one continued to play Mum, player two would also benefit from moving to Fink. On the other hand, if both player one and player two played Fink, then player one cannot benefit. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, sorry, player one cannot benefit by, by switching to, to mum. Similarly, player two cannot benefit by switching to Fink. So this is the Nash equilibrium because no player has any desire to, or no, no incremental benefit in deviating at that point. Okay. Now, it's a negative six, negative six. In this case, there's a unique Nash equilibrium. So, Christy, do you see why? Because if, if I was, if both players were playing Fink and Fink, then if player one, prisoner one, decided I want to switch to mum, that player's payoff would worsen. It would go from negative six to negative nine. So, player one doesn't want to change. Similarly, if player two changed, it goes from negative six to negative nine. So neither player finds any benefit in switching from here. As a consequence, we can conclude that this is a Nash equilibrium. If you use the same idea here, you'll see that both players have a benefit in terms of changing strategies. Right? So if you're here, and if player one decided to switch to Fink, that player immediately benefits because negative one is lower than zero. Right? Similarly here, you have the same observation. Is that clear? And you can see it for any of the other tuples as well. So if you're here, you can find something similar. Okay? Yes? Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, would you call um, Nash uh, equilibrium as a solution strategy or rather than... Uh, no, no. So the Nash equilibrium represents a, a stable point. It's an equilibrium point. Its definition is... And I have a precise definition later. So Xi star... So, so a Nash equilibrium is given by a tuple, which is a set of strategies xi star i equals 1 to n, such that xi star uh, is a minimizer of payoff fi xi x minus i star. So given that everybody else is at their equilibrium strategy, you are also at your equilibrium strategy, right? So no player has any desire to deviate. Okay? Yes? Mm-hmm. But what if I have, I mean, in some form of, I have no idea, but I have some probability that the other player would play like this. Right, so then, then this is no longer, this is under the assumption that you don't have that kind of setting. But I mean, the level of information, can it be there? So you could have a, so, so this is a, this, what I've given you is the, is the bare bones starting point, if you will for articulating a Nash equilibrium. There are, you know, like a host of different equilibria that emerge when you change informational requirements. It's, yeah, so that's, a, you know, it's an entirely kind of new area. But I, 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 I agree that, you know, the equilibria could change based on signaling, based on knowledge, based on, you know, there are a host of things that emerge. In this case, we're looking at a setting where the only information that I have is that I know my payoff and I know what the other person has played. So, I mean, having once he's played, I can evaluate the payoff. But you don't know your person wants to play, so there's no like self-sitting agent. So, so you don't know. You, so, so na naturally, you 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 know, you don't have access to his or her payoff functions. You don't you don't need that. All you know is that you you can evaluate your payoff. And the reason you can evaluate your payoff is that somehow you know what that person has has played. Yeah, you know that much. Because if you don't have that, then you have no way to even evaluate your own payoff. Well, it's not like evaluating based on the options available to you, independence of the other person. So it makes it, making it quite confusing. So uh, I don't want to say it's comprehensive because there are other. Th I mean, comp competitive, not comprehensive. That's making it a competitive 
setting. Uh, yeah, so it is a competitive setting, yes. Um, but yeah, these, this is under fairly stringent assumptions. So I mean, you could weaken these, you could, you could have other types of variations that are imposed, which could lead to very different equilibria. Okay, so, so this is the, so we have a notion of a, a normal form representation, where essentially you have a game where uh, corresponding to the strategy sets and the associated payoff functions. If you think about it, what are the primitives you need for you to go and compute an equilibrium? All you need are the strategy sets and the payoff functions. And when I say payoff functions, I need the algebraic structure. Okay. Um, now again, these are finite strategy games. In, in this course, we'll be looking largely at continuous strategy games, okay? where there's a continuum of strategies rather than just a finite set of those. Um, okay. So here's another instance where you actually have two equilibria. So essentially a similar situation where you have the, uh, where Chris and, and Pat are both trying to decide about where to go, and essentially what, they have deferring payoffs corresponding to whether they choose opera or baseball. And you can see that both of these are, are Nash equilibria, okay? And so there are two Nash equilibria, so there's a lack of uniqueness. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna to move to a, a setting of, of, uh, that, that is fairly well known, which is the Diopolistic Cournot model, which predates Nash equilibrium, okay? Um, so imagine a situation where firms one and two are competing um, and they produce a particular item, quantities Q1 and Q2 of a particular item, right? Suppose the overall quantity is Q1 plus Q2, okay? And the price is determined by that affine function A minus capital Q, okay? So let me write this down. It'll be easier if I just write this on the board. So you have two players, so player one, so the cost functions in this case are just C, okay, so C, so player one is optimizing C times Q1 minus P of Q times Q1. Now in this particular case, you have an inequality constraint Q1 greater than or equal to zero. I'm going to suppress it and we're going to assess if we can get equilibria which lie in the interior, which means that if I can get equilibria where the Q1 and Q2 happen to be positive, then you're fine, okay? And I'll show you actually that doesn't always have to happen. Here's the other problem, max of, sorry, min of CQ2 minus P of Q times Q2, okay? So now if you want to look at the first order conditions of this, so this is C of Q1, sorry, C, uh, CQ1 minus AQ1 plus uh, Q1 squared. There's no B, right? It's just A minus Q, right? Yeah. So it's A uh, Q times Q1. Okay, so this is the payoff function of F1 of Q1, Q2. And now if I differentiate this, What I get is C minus A. I know what Q is. Q is Q1 plus Q2. Right? So I can write this as Q1 plus Q2 times Q1. So this is 2Q1 plus Q2. Similarly, the gradient with respect to F2 is C minus A plus 2Q1 plus Q2. Now that's going to be equal to zero, right? And what you find is, you can solve for this, and what you're, you're left with is Q1 star is equal to Q2 star is basically, and remember I have an assumption that uh, I've stated right at the outset where C is less than A. So I'm left with A minus C over three. Okay, 
So now what you notice is, now it's, a, it's of course a symmetric Cournot game, both players have the same cost, marginal cost, and the equilibrium is at A minus C over 3. Now since A is greater than C, what happens is Q1 and Q2 star are both non-negative. So imposing a requirement like is superfluous, it doesn't matter. I've got solutions which are in the interior, it doesn't matter, okay. Now it's important because sometimes you'll find that you read papers, uh, particularly when in, in a lot of economics journals where they'll suppress inequality constraints because then the equilibrium conditions are just equations as opposed to inequalities, right? And so you want to be a little careful about that because when, when that is done, you want to ensure that those inequality constraints are somehow satisfied when they've been suppressed. If you fail to do that, then you've changed the problem. Right? So in this case, we know that we've done that and, and things are fine, right? We've not messed with it. I think the production costs are less this time, right? In the maximization part. In the maximization? The maximizing costs should be Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've missed it here. Yeah. This should be a C times Q1. C times Q2. I apologize. Um, so then, now you can see that if Q2 star is zero, then essentially what happens is Q1 star will, will, will uh, produce A minus C upon 2, which is the monopolist level. Okay, so you can show that. Now, there are several interesting points here. What happens if A is less than C? So C was greater, than, C, in this case C was less than A. What happens if C is greater than A? Right? And, and, and suppose I have costs where you have C1 and C2 and one of the C's is greater than A. Well, what happens is that you can't get rid of that non-negativity bound and you have to bring in the inequality constraints and that's where complementarity comes in. It's not obvious that you can just drop stuff you want to, you know, because you have that inequality constraint looming. Right? Now, I'll show you how that, that is done. Here's another example. Uh, so, this is an, uh, you know, a more refined electricity market. Uh, so, that, 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 that generalizes Kuno. So, producers have access to a a day ahead market, ignore the real time market. There are capacity constraint Cournot bids in the day ahead market. So now you have producers who have a capacity constraint and there's a, there are a variety of price functions for specifying prices, not just a simple A minus capital Q. It might be some general function which is you know, uh, descending with, with, so essentially it's A minus BQ is this function, right? You could also have functions like this right, more general functions. The question is how do you deal with those? So let's, let's talk about that. So consider a two node market. Suppose node one has a demand center while node two houses N electricity producers. So essentially you have a two node market. This is the demand, this is node two, and then you've got a bunch of producers, one to N, okay. Producer I produces QI megawatts during a specific hour with capacity CI and her cost functions, her cost function is given by this quadratic CI times QI plus half DI QI squared. So it's increasing convex as long as DI is positive. The transmission capacity on the link 1 comma 2 is infinite and the price of power is given again by some P of Q. I haven't told you what P of Q is, I just told you that it's dependent on the aggregates production or sales at that point. Okay. So does everybody see the distinction? I haven't specified what P of Q is. It's not necessarily A minus Q. It could be something else. Okay. So here's what the cost function, the, 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 opt the optimization problem is. It's, this is a typo here. This should be QI. So the sales are P of Q times QI minus the cost of generating. Subject to the requirement that QI is less than CI and QI is non-negative and this represents a Lagrange multiplier. Okay. And so now you're looking for a Nash equilibrium, Q1 star to QN star, which is effectively the constrained Cournot equilibrium, where QI star is an argmax of GI Q minus J star. So I want to make sure everybody understands this notation. So for player I to solve her optimization problem, she needs to know 
what her competitors are doing. Right? So her competitors decisions are captured by Q minus J. I, I'll, I might occasionally use Q minus J on top. It's, but Q minus J represents the set of Q or the Q minus I, J not equal to I. So this is a tuple of rival decisions. Okay? So these are taken as input. For you to even solve or even formulate this problem, I need to know what my rivals are doing. I'm going to assume that, that I have access to that. Now there are games or settings where I don't have that and I have to somehow learn that through some mechanism. Right? You can do that and, and there, are, there are schemes for that. But in this context, we're going to assume that we have access to that to articulate our optimization. Okay. So here's another setting called a flow control. So this actually shows up in communication networks where you have a host of users, they're using a communication link, and data is basically routed through this communication link across multiple routers before, um, you know, it comes from multiple routers before being send to the users and, and go back and forth. Okay? Um, so in this particular case, you have users who can, whose utility function is based on the amount of flow that they send across. And this flow, their own flow, so they have some logarithmic utility function. And there is a cost of sending flow, and this cost of sending flow comes from the congestion of the link. So if you use too much of the link, what happens is as, and so there are different ways to model this. One way to model this is using a capacity constraint of the link directly. That leads to a generalized model, which I won't put here. The other way to model it is say, as you get closer and closer to this constraint, you know, so summation of xi cannot exceed m. m is the capacity on the link. If it gets very close to m, this thing blows up. So one way to model that cost is to just add a penalty function that corresponds to the residual capacity. If that residual capacity in the link becomes zero, the cost function goes up to infinity. So essentially you're trying to satisfy this requirement. And each player is faced with this utility function less the cost of sending flow. Okay. So that's the kind of problem you're sent. You're, and essentially you're, you, you want, so you can be in, imposing this constraint outside. I want to get a set of xi star such that this holds. Okay. Now, implicitly what happens is that you're going to, as long as this is a finite quantity, you're going to get that the constraint is met. Okay. So that's actually superfluous. I don't need the summation of xi less than m. Um, now, what happens when you have mixed strategies? So when you had, remember when you had pure strategies, um, there's a cell, you know, that there are results which can show, you, which, you know, which have been shown over the years uh, and was amongst the first few results shown that pure strategy, Nash equilibria, when you have finite strategies, don't necessarily exist, right? They don't necessarily exist. But Nash's seminal result was that for a finite strategy game, a mixed strategy always exists, right? How did, how was this shown? And we're going to do this tomorrow, yeah, most right tomorrow. He used fixed point arguments, right? He used a fixed point theorem, and we're going to do that. Uh, but before that, I want to at least define what a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium looks like. So in a host of practical settings, strategy decisions are generally continuous variables, like we had before. How much should you produce? How much flow should you send? Right? But there are settings where you have to decide from a finite set of strategies. Should you commit a generation decision or not? Should you play a particular strategy like Fink versus Mum? What should you do, right? So, in a when you have a pure strategy, and so if you had a, 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 a finite strategy game, you can actually construct what is called a mixed strategy where you randomize across these pure strategies. So, suppose I had a situation where the you had the two prisoners, and the prisoners were trying to establish whether to play Mum or Fink with a certain probability. So suppose I decided to play Fink with probability PI1 or P11 and Mum with probability P12 and the other player does, you know, plays Fink with probability P21 and, and Mum with probability P22. And of course, P11 plus P12 have to add up to 1. P21 plus P22 have to add up to 1. 
Now a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium essentially is a equilibrium in these probability distributions. They're actually probability mass functions. Okay, so if you got an if you have an equilibrium in that, what does it mean mathematically? It just means that if players use this probability mass function to choose a strategy, then there's an equilibrium in those probability mass functions. It doesn't say anything about an equilibrium in the pure strategies. Okay. Now let's let's try and understand how to formulate this problem. Okay. So now I want to make sure the variables. So in the past, remember when we had the game prisoner's dilemma, it was in some sense a discrete optimization problem. I had to choose between two, two specific strategies, bless you. But now I just need to solve a continuous optimization problem where I need to choose the PIKs, where K goes from 1 to capital K and that's the number of strategies, right? And PIKs have to be between 0 and 1, okay? So you're optimizing over a simplex. Okay, so now let's write that out. Uh, did I have that? Okay, I didn't have that. But essentially what happens is, let me just write that out so everybody understands it. So essentially what happens is that now, um, if you're looking at, so let's take player one. Player one essentially, um, so what you need to do is you'll need to, um, yeah, okay, I don't want to write this up because it's going to be a bit nasty, but let me tell you how I would, yeah, so it's going to be a little, a, a little painful because you, I'll, I'll do this downstream. I have a result for biometric schemes. I think I did this. Let me just check. Uh, where's the biometric scheme result? Okay, no, I think I have it later when I do complementarity. Yeah, I do have it later when I do complementarity. So I'll hold off on that. So suffice to say that this problem of working in, uh, for solving for these distributions can be recast as a simple linear complementarity problem. And I'll show you that equivalence, not in this lecture, but two lectures from now. So let's hold off, because if I write it out, it's, I'm gonna need to give you machinery. I don't wanna do that yet. Okay, um, and what is important is that the mixed strategy result can be captured completely by the tools that I'm gonna provide in this class, okay? At least over the case where there are a finite number of these strategies, right? Um, now, this course is devoted to settings where the strategies are continuous variables, right? So when you have mixed strategies, I've, I've converted the problem to a continuous strategy problem. And, and I'm interested in problems where the functions are twice continuously differentiable or, or differentiable. And why is, and, and generally I need convexity. And because of convexity, I'm allowed to get necessary and sufficient conditions of optimality. And those are then recast as complementarity or variational problems. Right? So consider a Nash equilibrium problem where the player solves a, you know, minimizes some function like that over the non-negative orthod. Okay? And let's assume for the time being that player i's con function is convex in xi given x minus i. So this is important for everyone to see. A player's payoff function need only be convex in that person's decision variable, given what everybody else is doing. It doesn't have to be convex in the other person's decision variable, because you're only optimizing in your own decisions, right? As a consequence, the necessary and sufficient conditions of this, so I want to make sure you understand this, so if you look at this, right? So I want to make sure everybody understands how to write down the optimality conditions here. So if I want to, if I gave you this problem, so one way to write out this problem is the following. If I said this is lambda i, remember by the if I tell you this is convex, then the first order conditions are necessary and sufficient, okay, under convexity. So if I write down the first order conditions, so let's just keep this as gradient of fi of x, and now I do minus lambda i times the gradient of this. The gradient of this is what? Just the identity, right, just one there. 
So, you are going to get this is equal to 0. Right, and this comes from complementarity. Okay, so now if you're wondering how I got this, I got this exactly the same way that I showed you when I had the Lagrangian function. Remember, I did this with the Lagrangian function, where I wrote the Lagrangian function. I had so this was the inequality constraint. The Lagrangian function was lambda i of x lambda i was f i plus lambda i x i minus. One second. Uh, minus x. Uh, no, it's minus, minus lambda. Okay. And then I took the first order conditions, which is gradient of f i minus lambda i equals zero, and I required complementarity between the inequality constraints and the Lagrange multiplier. So before I proceed, because this is crucial, I want to make sure everybody understands how I got this. I got this entirely from my discussion on necessary conditions of optimality. The reason why they are sufficient is because the problem is convex. When the function is convex, these necessary conditions are also sufficient. Clear? Alicia? Alicia? Is that clear? I've got, I've got a few people a little concerned. So I'll slow it down. We'll make sure we all get it. So if you remember when we started a few slides ago, we said that if I gave you a constrained optimization problem, in the simple case, I gave you a constrained optimization problem like this one. I said minimize f of x subject to g of x less than 0. So the Lagrangian function was L of x lambda, f of x plus g of x transpose lambda. Everybody with me? This was the Lagrangian function. What were the necessary conditions of optimality? I just take the gradient of the Lagrangian in x. So this is gradient of f plus gradient of g of x transpose lambda equals 0. And I require complementarity between g of x and lambda. So is this clear? Right? We did this a, f a few slides back. Right? So now these conditions were necessary when the function was not necessarily convex. If I assume additionally that f and g are convex, then what I have is that that condition of conditions is necessary and sufficient. Why is the sufficiency such an important notion? Because then I can replace, so then I can replace the statement that xi is a minimizer with these conditions. They're completely equivalent. If I get a solution to these, it's equivalent to saying I've got a minimizer of the original problem. Is that clear? I've applied that same notion here. Now the function is the same, f. The g is just x. So the Lagrangian function is, and now, actually I should put a transpose here because this could be a vector. Um, and now I take the gradient. I get gradient of fi minus lambda i equals 0, and I get complementarity between lambda i and xi. Clear? Yes? So the way I, uh, the, 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 general, the general rule there is to write everything as, I usually write it as a less than equal to constraint, right? And then when I add the multipliers, I just put plus lambda i transpose the, the constraint. So if you have a greater than equal to, just switch it here. So when I had a greater than equal to, then the g of that is negative x is less than equal to 0. And I take it up, and then I get minus, uh, so I get plus negative x transpose lambda, which is this. This one? Yeah. Oh, so this expression is always, the, the Lagrange multipliers are, Lambda i's are non-negative, and here in this case, x i is non-negative. Okay. The sign of the multipliers comes from the top here. So here, so you worry about that from there. Okay. So now look at lambda i. I can rewrite this as just this, right? Which means I can write this whole condition as zero.
the simple condition because lambda i can be substituted by this guy. Okay, so I I end up with. How would I start? With the condition of twice continuous being differentiable, you exclude linear objective functions. Is there? No, no, I don't. I just say it, if, if it's linear, it's it's still twice continuously. It's just. Uh, it's just that the second derivatives are zero. Yeah. That's all. This still is differentiable. Yeah, it's twice as all it's infinitely. So it's okay. That's not the issue. I think the I don't even need twice actually. I only need once because I only use gradients. The reason why I keep it twice is because uh, in in previous discussions I've talked about Newton. So that's the only reason. But for all of the work we do, we're only going to need once differentiable. Okay? And in fact, for lots of problems, just you know, if it's just convex, it's enough because I work with the sub differential. Yes? So, you can get uh, often so. just using Michelson problem, then consider x minus y as parameter? Yes, as a parameter. Um, okay, it's a constant for this problem. And should, should we solve it for each set? For each, and exactly. So, now for each of them, I write that condition down. I concatenate these and I get n of them, right? Now I can write these compactly as this complementarity problem. So this is now called a complementarity problem, right? It's a complementarity problem because I'm looking for a vector x that lies, so I'm looking for a vector x that lies in the non-negative orthon such that it's orthogonal to the mapping also lying in the non-negative orthon where x and the, the mapping are both uh, orthogonal to each other. Okay, so that's that's, and I'm going to define complementarity problems as we proceed. But for the time being, you can so in general, a nonlinear complementarity problem is is a problem to find an x in R n plus such that x is non-negative, f is non-negative, where f is a mapping, and x and f are perpendicular. And what I mean by that is x i times f i of x is equal to zero for all i. And that's exactly what happens here, right? In this case, the mapping f is the concatenation of the gradient maps, okay? So this is a complementarity problem. You can also write this as a variational problem. So now, let's start by saying, okay, suppose instead of the situation where I had, um, So let's let's write this out. So first I want to define something. If I had a problem like this. So up till now I said xi was non-negative, right? Let's assume that xi is just some non-empty closed and convex set in Rni. Not necessarily R plus or Rn plus, just some closed and convex set. So an example of this could be just xi could be the set of xi such that xi satisfies is non-negative, xi satisfies capacity constraints, you know, whatever. Could be any such thing. Um, so now, xi is a solution to this problem. I'm going to call this problem the optimization problem x minus i, because x minus i is a parameter of this problem, this optimization problem, if and only if, I'm going to assume that fi is convex and xi is convex. These two are both convex. If and only if yi minus xi transpose, and this is in xi, Okay, so this is saying that xi is a solution to this optimization problem if and only if xi solves this variational inequality problem. So you remember I introduced the variational inequality problem as a generalization of that stationarity condition. 
I said, hey, if you have a stationarity condition like gradient of f of x equals zero, I can write that as y minus x transpose the gradient is equal to, is greater than or equal to zero. Well, this is a further generalization. It's a necessary and sufficient condition for the optimality of a point to a convex optimization problem. We're going to again revisit this tomorrow, but I want to start by doing it today. Okay? And now, just as we did before, for each optimization problem, I can write this out. So remember for the previous problem, I had n players, each of them solving this problem. If I, saw, if I do this for each player, I get exactly that. So if you remember, so this is for player each, sorry. For each player, if I get the necessary and sufficient condition of this problem, what do I get? I get for all, now in this case, xi is just a non-negative orthant, so all yi greater than zero, okay? So that's exactly what I got here. I stack these up and I get this collection of variational inequalities, okay? So this collection of variational inequalities, just as we had a collection of complementarity problems and I wrote one single complementarity problem, this collection of variational inequalities is often referred to as a Cartesian variational inequality. Why is it called Cartesian? Because there's a Cartesian product that is looming underneath and that Cartesian product is the product of these sets x1 to xn. So I can write these n Cartesian, these n variational inequalities and they're not separable. They're coupled because I need to get a solution x1, the solution this one depends on x minus 1. The solution the next one depends on x minus 2, right? So this is a coupled system and I need to get one solution. It turns out, I'm going to show this later, this is equivalent to a single variational inequality with a mapping f. So what I end up showing later, let me just write that down. So y1 minus x1 transpose gradient of f of x1, f of x greater than zero. So this whole thing is equivalent to y minus x transpose f of x where f of x is the concatenation of the gradient maps. So a single variational inequality can give you a solution to all of these. Now it's not like there's a free lunch. The dimension of this is going to be the same dimension as the sum of these dimensions. So the dimension of this is Rn1. This is Rn uh, capital N. Now this is N. So it's a summation of N1 to N capital N. So no free lunch. I mean, it's basically just a, a larger variational inequality, but it's a single one. Okay, so now what happens if you generalize this? So in a lot of cases, the decisions that you make are coupled not just through the objective, but through the constraints with what other players do. That leads to what is called a generalized Nash game. So in a generalized Nash game, what happens is instead of the players making decisions, at least their feasibility requirements are independent of what everybody else does, here they're coupled. So this k of x minus i refers to the requirement that is imposed by the rival's decisions, okay? So for instance, imagine you have a large pizza and you're all taking out pieces. Now if, if, if everybody else has made a decision and you, take a, you only have a little bit left, then there isn't much you can do. So their decisions affect yours. Now the point is that it's, we haven't introduced the notion of um, timing in this. So everybody makes a decision simultaneously. So the question is not, 
you know, do do some does does one player have a an advantage in terms of when he or she makes a decision? But only is there an equilibrium when there is this requirement that everybody's decision has to, you know, meet some requirement like a pizza requirement or something. But the key difference is when I write down optimality conditions in this parameterized form, then instead of the set being just k or ki, it's k of x minus i. Because now this is, a, this is what you have access to given what everybody else is doing. Okay? And this, this together now, this is just a standard variational inequality because this given x minus i is a constant. But when you couple them together, you're left with what is called a quasi, and actually this is a Cartesian quasi variational inequality, but anyway, let's call this, this is, a, 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 this is often called a quasi variational inequality. And the reason is, uh, actually I didn't, I didn't specify that, I'll do that. Um, in a quasi variational inequality, referred to as QVI XF, you need to find an X such that Y minus X transpose F of X is non-negative for all Y in some X of X. So X of X, capital X of X is uh, a set valued map. So it's basically a map which says that for certain values of, you know, for previously it was just this, right? It was a constant set. Now you have this showing up. And I'll give you examples. This is a little bit abstract. But once I give you examples, it'll become clear. Okay? Um, and it comes from such settings. It comes from these settings where you have some interaction in the strategy sets. Your strategy sets are no longer independent of what your competitors do. Well, I keep that. No, that is so. Finally, let's talk about stackelberg curnow So in stackelberg curnow essentially you have a situation where you have a leader and you have a subordinate or a follower. And the subordinate moves second and the leader is knowledgeable about how the subordinate reacts and as a consequence can improve his or her payoff based on that knowledge. So imagine, so I'm going to give you an example, say from the automobile industry where GM may be a leader while Ford and Chrysler may be considered to be followers, or in traffic networks where network operators set tolls uh, while users respond to each and, and reach an equilibrium subject to these tolls, okay? So what is crucial to note is a follower's problem can be viewed as an optimality, can be viewed as a variational inequality or a complementarity problem that is parameterized by the leader's decision. So let's give you an example. So firm one chooses a quantity Q1. Firm two observes Q1 and maximizes its Cournot payoff. Q2 times the price function minus C. Okay. Firm two's best response given what firm one is doing is A minus Q1 minus C over two. Right? Now remember, if Q1 is zero, then Q2 gets the entire payoff, which is A minus C over two, or the entire production that it wants. But now, given that we know Q, how Q2 is gonna respond, how player two responds, firm one may choose Q1 by solving its own optimization problem where it substitutes Q2 with exactly this. So you find that the Stackelberg payoff is Q1 sets A minus C over two, and Q2 sets A minus C over four. So you remember in the Cournot, it was A minus C over three. Both came up with the same decision. When one of them has a leadership role, that person can get more of the market share, and the other person is left with a smaller amount, okay? How do you solve that problem? So the way to solve that problem is to take the Q2. Now in this particular case, if you notice what we did, we were able to get a close form expression for the follower's problem. In general, such a closed form expression is not available. And when it's not available, we rewrite that closed form expression in terms of a complementarity problem or a variational inequality problem. 
These optimality conditions are necessary and sufficient for the follower's decision to be optimal given what the leader has done. Right? And then the leader says, oh, I know how the follower is going to respond. Let me make a decision with, where I maximize my own payoff given that I know how the follower, the follower will respond. Okay, is that clear? And so we're going to be looking at these types of hierarchical problems. We look at Nash games between hierarchical players. But what I wanted to do was use this as a, this was actually just supposed to be lecture zeros, just to give you an introduction.